Um, so uh, I was asked to speak about why introduce robots into uh, surgical practice, into spine surgical practice. And basically, as has been said before, the thing about the robot is that it is not a independent, self-automating, self-drilling, self-placing machine. It is enabling technology. And that's a little bit of a buzzword that we use. Uh, but I like it because it kind of really emphasizes the fact that it's there to improve a spine surgeon's life. We want to produce a consistent, reliable, predictable tool to uh, also do the same for our operations. We want to make our operations as consistent as possible in technique and in the outcome. And I think that this is the, this is the role of the robot. It's a tool. And so, you know, um, we, we've learned today about the value of uh, preoperative planning and the techniques that go, for example, with deformity um, surgery. And a lot of it really is understanding the deformity. You know, we have these range of classification systems that really guide us with respect to how to understand the deformity better, which, which then necessitates how we tackle the deformity, what, what surgical approach we take. And we, if we want to get into the um, habit of systematizing this, this is where having a tool that breaks it down in those components and allows us to, for example, do the preoperative planning, uh, allows us to understand the navigation of the patient and then execute the plan that we have preoperatively um, made, then, then it, it makes the case for the robot. So what is it? It's, it's these three things. It's the planning software. It's the advanced computer-assisted navigation, and robotics is navigation. It has to be navigation. And then uh, it's the application of that intraoperative 3D imaging to execute um, the, the plan through this robotic device. And nowadays, there are so many of them. Um, you know, you have uh, all kinds of companies now doing robotics and, and development of robotics through uh, increased te technological, um, uh, basically, advantages and manipulations to get that. And not only is it increasing capacity, but it's exciting to see some platforms specifically look at reducing cost, for example, in, in, in the ambulatory surgery center. So, you know, the, the breadth and the um, capacity of robotics is increasing and it's becoming more and more pragmatic and practical. So what is it? So the, firstly, to understand what it is, it's kind of like MIS surgery. You know, it's never really been a clear or clean definition for me. But in order to, what, to understand what it really is, let's define what it isn't, and then we can make it uh, as to what it is. And then when we know what it is, we can use it effectively for the goals that we have. So like I said, it's not a automatic automated, self-planning, self-implanting, self-executing machine. In other words, it is not a surgeon. That is you, that is your role as a surgeon to utilize the best tools that you have, including your ability to synthesize the imaging information uh, and, and planning as to what procedure is best for the patient, and then feed that into the tool uh, where it makes sense to do that. It's not also, on the flip side of that, the future of it is not just to place a screw. The reality of it is not just placing screws. I think this is, and it seems obvious, but this is where a lot of um, the uh, cynicism towards robotics in spine surgery has been based. Because uh, rightly so, many experienced surgeons will say, why do I need a robot to place screw instrumentation when I'm already at the 95 to 99% accurate screw placement rate with my technique. Why do I need that? Well, the value of it is that it is, it will accurately place instrumentation such as screws, but currently and, and progressively, it does a lot more than that. It isn't MIS, and, and, I, and this, is, uh, this is kind of a really important point. You know, we, if we're going to take a posture of, of humility and learning with respect to the robot, we, we can't bandy around the fact that it's MIS because it makes a smaller incision. In my hands, anecdotally, the incisions are not smaller. You know, uh, when I do my deformity cases, of course, it's the same length. 
uh, even in small constructs when it's one or two levels, as we saw earlier today, the incision ends up being about the same with the paraspinal or we'll see incision as it does with the midline incision. In fact, sometimes maybe it's more because of the fact that you need to uh, maneuver the rod into place with the, uh, with the rod driver. So, you know, let's be careful with that. Um, and it is not inexpensive. You know, uh, it ranges at, at a minimum, depending on uh, which platform and what capacity you, you want to incorporate, it can range from around three to, you know, $400,000 all the way to one plus a million. So this is a significant investment uh, resource-wise into uh, obtaining this platform uh, for your practice. So then what is it? Well, we've heard what it isn't. So what it is, is um, it's a navigated image guidance arm. Uh, currently, that's what it is. Um, it's a very good navigated image guidance arm because it's accurate. And we have so much data, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit. Uh, but this is from a paper that came out recently that, that uh, described the evolution of the accuracy of pedicle screw placement uh, over the years that the robot's been in place. It uh, allows us to select ahead of time the maximum implant size, both diameter, length, uh, and optimal trajectory ahead of time, which we can plan on the imaging that we've acquired ahead of time. So that's something that, that reduces uh, both cognitive load on behalf of the patient uh, preoperatively and maximizes the implant that's placed. It is a pathway for minimizing soft tissue dissection. And this is where I would argue that it is a tool for minimally invasive surgery. So uh, where you can adequately uh, and accurately place instrumentation with minimal muscle and soft tissue disruption, I define that as minimally invasive surgery. And it is a portal for more than screw placement, of, as we'll see, such as planning for inner body uh, software and inner body placement. And it's all about navigation. Robotics is navigation. Uh, and it's, importantly, it's precise navigation. So, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a machine on a factory line that will pump out uh, screws for you for the reasons that we've mentioned. But it's an assistive device, and it really is as clever and as good as the surgeon's ability to manipulate the tool that's at hand. So the story of robotics is the story of navigation. And as part of that, its minimum capacity or capability is placing uh, a, a screw trajectory, whether, whether it be through actual execution of the placement through a guided arm or a K wire and so on. And, it's, and it does that through all of the things that we mentioned through computer assisted navigation and, and, and so on. Now, how do we acquire that data? And this is where I think it's a significant advantage. As was mentioned by Dr. Chapman before, radiation is an important aspect of it. And, and I'll address this. But it does allow us to preoperatively acquire CT level uh, uh, navigation or CT level imaging that we can utilize for planning ahead of time. And this is a significant advantage uh, to intraoperative, um, uh, relying on intraoperative image, imaging. So some of the things that I want to cover br briefly was about accuracy, efficiency, for example, uh, if you take single position surgery with the patient in the lateral decubitus position or in the prone position, what it has done is unlock ergonomic efficiency for the surgeon by reducing um, awkward angles of positioning with either the patient in that decubitus position or uh, prone, for example, and lateral placement, uh, maximizing the ergonomics and the benefit for the surgeon ultimately for the patient. And uh, as I said, we can obviously pre-plan screws, we can pre-plan uh, inner body uh, placement now, and in the, in the very near future, osteotomy cuts, and we can plan our osteotomies for our three-column uh, deformity correction. So let's tackle some of these and, and, and give sort of some convincing data for it. So this was a systematic review uh, published recently uh, looking at 16 studies that had uh, compared uh, robot to freehand placement uh, for pedicle screws. 
Uh, out of the 16, 13 showed benefit or uh, in terms of accuracy, statistically significant benefit for robotic placement, two no significant difference, and one demonstrated higher accuracy for the freehand technique, but that study in itself was somewhat biased uh, because of the uh, experience of the surgeon uh, with respect to robotics compared to uh, experienced surgeon with respect to freehand uh, technique. So I would, I would postulate that if you remove the experience factor and had equipoise between the two, you probably would have seen at least no significant difference. In the, in the 18 studies, in the remaining 18 studies of the 34 uh, the, that didn't have a comparison group, the lowest accuracy reported for robotic screw placement was 95%, which is, you know, uh, at least non-inferior with, with respect to um, the best navigation that, that, that we have. Radiation. Uh, this is particularly important uh, because it's going to impact all of our lives. It's it's a important facet of our practice as surgeon. So the surgeon is not exposed to radiation uh, at least during the image acquisition. Firstly, because if preoperative CT is decided, then that's that's a burden on the on the on the patient, not on the surgeon. As we mentioned before, we can cut down the number of CT images. Uh, if you if you obtain routinely obtain preoperative CT imaging, you can obtain th uh, thin cuts of one millimeter or less at the time of sur at the time of preoperative CT acquisition, and that is it. That's all you'll need for both anatomy delineation as well as preoperative um, CT uh, planning uh, and incorporation as a merge with intraoperative fluoroscopy. So uh, basically, um, there's re reduced uh, radiation exposure for the surgeon. There's uh, reduced uh, exposure per screw placement and total exposure time if you were to congregate uh, that data together. And that's now been shown with, with more and more in, uh, studies demonstrating radiation advantage. We talked about ergonomics. Um, you know, uh, I, I am a advocate of a prone positioning. Uh, for both lateral and all my posterior approaches. It makes sense for me in my hands to do that. Uh, it avoids a flip for me, um, but even if I was to uh, stick with lateral decubus single position surgery, I'm now able to minimize the impact of the sky factor, as we talked about earlier today, as well as the awkward angles required, even using something so, such as O-arm neuro navigation uh, to, to reach the uh, um, uh, downsided screw or uh, angles, if you like, angles of downsided screw placement. So uh, it's an evolving workflow and expanding indications. So again, as I said, traditionally it's been about screw placement. It's now becoming uh, SI fusion, pelvic fixation with S2 uh, ailer iliac screw placement. Posterior cervical spine, there's exciting developments down, uh, coming down the pipe where there'll be more real-time uh, uh, development of, of the imaging accuracy with respect to motion and an emotion segment such as the cervical spine. Um, it's comfortable for the surgeon, and this matters over uh, the course of a lifetime, as we, as we all know. And then the other aspect of it, which I find exciting, is that we can incorporate other modalities, such as CT angiography. So for example, my institution, I, I use it for SI joint placement. And the thing about the SI joint is that, for example, the superior gluteal artery is at risk uh, across the ilium uh, for placement of this screw. I can incorporate that CTA uh, into my preoperative planning and work around vessels uh, that would otherwise lead to problems. And we've had certainly had uh, at least one case where a patient required readmission to hospital and subsequent embolization of that artery because of continued leak. So, you know, th these are not problems that are restricted to rarity. Uh, they will occur again and again uh, if we can incorporate other modalities into the imaging, even such as MRI, um, that will be enormously advantageous. 
And of course, uh, I think for the surgeon, the biggest factor is the reduced cognitive or mental bandwidth that's required for assessment of uh, placement, particularly under the stress of the operation itself. Uh, and, and the stress doesn't just come from the actual OR, but, but as in the, the operation, but it's also the timing uh, that's involved, the time factor that's involved, and all the pressure that comes from OR administration in the hospital to reduce that. We all have that. So let's talk about some advantages with, with respect to, um, uh, for example, lateral cases. So we're now uh, able to, for example, place our retractors through a robotic arm. So it actually becomes a way of fixation of the retractor as well. Um, We've talked about preoperative CT planning. We, we've predetermined the size of the instrumentation, uh, such as both the screws as well as the implants. Uh, and that's, that's already planned with our uh, preoperative planning software. I'm going to show a small video of that. We're able to navigate all the disk preparation instruments, such as our curettes and rasps and so on. Uh, we have the option to remove the C-arm from the field. And in my anecdotal experience, and this has been mirrored by a lot of uh, our, our colleagues, is that over time, where we would expect inaccuracy to set in because of, of progressive uh, sequential implant placement and, if you like, inaccuracy set in from uh, at least craniocaudal displacement from the implants, that's really uh, not the case or its impact is, is easily um, cognitively uh, uh, countered for. Um, and so it ends up being far more accurate even with sequential implant placement than, than you would think. So uh, to be fair, we just do also need to touch on the disadvantages as well. There is a steep learning curve, obviously, here, because not only is it new technology, um, but uh, it, it, there, are, there are lots of factors that can either slow down or become troubleshooting um, issues for, for, throughout the case. Uh, so we've found that there's about a 30 screw uh, placement uh, kind of inflection point at which there's a significant improvement in accuracy on behalf of the operator. The other thing about it is uh, that the observer uh, learned, so in a study done where there was uh, a assistant that purely observed uh, X number of cases and then went to placing the screws in, there was significantly uh, faster and more transferable skills to the observer uh, compared to uh, not being able to observe and go fresh to robotic placement. So there's value in the fact that it's easy to teach as well. So this is uh, the classic you know, adoption curve, it's a learning curve, and you start at the beginning and there's a steep gradient to the curve where you accelerate with respect to your learning and then you reach some plateau of competence. I actually would argue that it's the opposite, that what, what happens is that as the cases go on, the number of, uh, the amount of time and complications, this is the real curve that as surgeons we're interested in, it decreases. So we have a inflection point after which we have a rapid reduction in the uh, time wastage, troubleshooting, complications, um, you know, uh, OR, OR time wastage. And then we reach this plateau where we've reached our sort of efficiency. So, it, so this is the curve that I think is more ap applicable. And there's obviously costs that we've talked about. So, but with respect to cost, let's talk about it. Um, so I love this study from Neurospine that came out um, uh, recently because it, it took the uh, savings benefit with respect to the complications that were avoided by using a uh, computer-assisted navigation-based robotic system and it found the following advantages. So when you save time, for example, through an MIS application, uh, in other words, uh, you didn't um, open the patient, there wasn't uh, max, maximum um, access issues, uh, that translated to something like 317 minutes, which in their healthcare system was a, uh, more than a $5,000 cost saving. Then uh, if you had MIS or open cases where uh, 9.47 revisions were avoided from malpositioning of the instrumentation, that was a $314,000 saving. 
where you converted um, from open to MIS uh, based on the fact that you had robotic navigation available. At 2.3 infections avoided, which is the number needed to treat uh, to uh, have a significant outcome, was a $36,000 cost saving. And then the number of days of hospital stay avoided by all of the complications by converting to MIS because you had robotics available was a $250,000 savings. So in one year, in that healthcare system, by these authors, there was a 600, more than a $600,000 cost saving, which is, uh, in the worst case scenario of, a, let's say, a million dollar uh, machine, uh, close to about a two thirds cost saving. So, um, and then, of course, you know, depending on the platform that's, that's used with respect to the disp disposables and so on, it can still be a significant advantage. So, I, I just love this study. So, let's uh, briefly use the case example of a prone lateral. Uh, this was a study that looked at robotic use of prone lateral. Um, they used, it was a revision study. Uh, they used robot in, in two thirds of their patient. Um, they had mean times, uh, documented complication rates, and so on. They were able to achieve placement of the implant in their ideal position, which was anterior, and avoid posterior uh, placement in every single uh, case. Um, for one out of 10 cases, there was subsidence. Uh, there wasn't in the, in the remainder, and I think, again, that's because partly it's because of correct placement of the implant based on uh, robotic uh, or navigation. Um, and then uh, this, I, I love this sort of metric, which is the overhang with a lateral implant. Um, using the navigation assisted um, with, 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 the robot, with the robot, they're able to achieve a 94% correct placement of lateral listhesis with, with respect to the implant. So, you know, we heard from Dr. Pimenta um, about a prone lateral, or PTP, I should say. I, I, I don't want to, um, you know, uh, get the, the terminology wrong. Um, and we, we see the benefits, for example, in, in this technique. Uh, I've converted all my laterals to this. Um, and this is a case that I want to demonstrate. So, MIS case. A uh, patient presents with both central and, more importantly, uh, biforaminal neural compression uh, of the uh, L3 nerve root here with significant radiculopathy uh, on the left side. And uh, this is uh, a video of our preoperative planning uh, using the, the imaging technology. I'm able to line up the heads of the screws perfectly for rod placement that I don't even get with O-arm navigation, for example, and, that, and that's an important factor. And then this is the, the merge that you see. So I have preoperative CT that I've acquired, and it's co-registered to intraoperative X-ray. See, not, not, that, not that many... Uh, Muscles are recruited in the upper extremities, um, both by my residents uh, and myself. It allows those muscles to be utilized in the gym later that evening for uh, bodybuilding workouts. And um, now here's our implant uh, being placed with navigation through the navigation software. Um, preoperatively marked out. You can see the shadow of the, of the preoperative mark. So I rotate the patient. In this case, it's easier. I bring the CRM in just as a check, but nowadays I hardly do that as well. Here's my, my disc preparation um, being done with a rasp. And then you'll see my resident, um, you know, uh, carefully placing in the implant. This is the result that we that we get, that you would, you would get, of course, with any imaging, um, adequate imaging system, but it, it reduced the mental and cognitive load significantly. So why should I do it? And this is the ultimate question. Well, it's navigation, but it's more precise navigation. There's a lot of data now that demonstrates that. You can preoperatively plan both your screws and your implants. It's more than just screws, and you will see this coming down the pipe. And we'll talk about it, AI, AR, VR. 
It is MIS because it's decreased physical load on the patient through soft, minimizing soft tissue disruption. But more importantly, it's decreased cognitive load on the surgeon as well. And ultimately, it's evolution of this technology. Sorry, but um, slide messed up. But you were going to see the computer evolving from an abacus basically now to something that's portable you know, for you, either on your wrist or, or anything else. So why not? Why hide from technology? This is a natural evolution of the technologies that we have. And as long as we recognize that it is a tool and not more than that, um, we're able to, to, to do it. And see, Rod, I want you to know that when you get the robot, everything in your OR will go faster, <laughs> <laughs> including your uh, fellows, okay? That's great. So you need this. Wow. Yeah, you need this. So the future. Well, can you imagine bringing augmented reality into it where you can look down instead of at a screen but incorporate the patient's landmarks through uh, whatever visualization platform uh, to, to really augment what you see? Um, I think for plexus detection, lumbar plexus detection, it'll be merging that preoperative MRI. And this is where we've put a lot of effort in our research of MRI neurography um, to outline the lumbar plexus and ultimately uh, plan that and merge that with intraoperative um, fluoroscopy. And so when you place your dilators, you're able to avoid the plexus. I think this is really important. Um, what's coming down the pipe is, is rod contouring and manipulation um, to, to incor as, incorporate it as part of uh, robotics. And so it's going to be easy for placement of the rod. Um, obviously, um, this is the most exciting part of it, is segmentation, automatic segmentation, where the machine has learned enough to be able to identify the lamina, for example, or identify uh, the pedicle, both for automatic uh, pedicle uh, planning, pedicle screw planning, there, there is that already. There are some uh, technologies that allow that already, but also uh, because it will automate, for example, a wide decompression uh, through recognition of those segments. And a better workaround for posterior cervical, which is a challenge because of the mobility of the cervical spine. So in other words, uh, maximizing our real-time application. And then using AI um, and all of the things from AI for both research uh, and planning and ultimately surgery. So the true robot of the future will accomplish your decompression, it'll correct your deformity, and it'll remove your tumor. And that's where we're heading to. Thank you. Um, it's an exciting time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great talk, news. <laughs> I mean, there's no question. I think robotics, you know, AR, mm. VR. I mean, all there's all these cool things that are happening. It's such an exciting time mm. in spine, and I think that companies are doing a terrific job of building these platforms. So yeah, it kudos is. to you and and keep up the great work. Yeah, thank you, Arkansas. thank you. Yeah, I think uh, the more we work on it mm -hmm. together, uh, we'll reduce costs and we'll make it more more practical. You know. Uh, for example, for the ASC setting and, yeah. and that kind of thing. Great job. All right, thank you. Great to have you as always. Yeah. So we're um, we're down to our last demo.